Nations is their own self-determination and that the UN cannot go in and tell you know, any other government how they should be doing things and organizing things within, within their states, you know, within, within their borders. You see this, I mean, the best example of this is when what to do with, in situations of genocide, for example, during civil wars. The UN has time and again show, proven that it is not, the UN wasn't established for that. And it's very poorly, it's not really capable of dealing with that as an institution. And we see, we see that at the time, and it, you know, there are these, the famous example of Rwanda, for example, where the UN just wasn't, didn't have the capacity to deal with it. Because, again, because of the importance of the sovereignty of the member state, which sometimes takes precedence and over the human rights of the people living, living within that member state. And it's, it's a horrible situation, of course. So just rem remember that we can't expect too much of the, of the UN in general. And then the forum, the forum's place within the UN is to provide recommendations to the UN system. And then the UN system and the member states can choose to do whatever they like with those recommendations. But hopefully, obviously, these recommendations are well done, they're well researched, and there's a, a decent secretariat then that follows up on those recommendations working with the agencies and with the member states. But often, the, but the, these are only recommendations, and you can do, and they do with them as they please. So in the video, uh, it mentioned that there are, uh, the indigenous populations are often located in more remote and isolated uh, places. So I'm wondering, what is the, the outreach process uh, to getting to these, I'm assuming, various and many different indigenous populations in these kind of isolated communities? And is it mainly them coming to, to us, or is it NGO or UN representatives? I guess who spearheads the outreach, and what does that process look, look like? That's, that's an excellent question, and it's one of the, our major challenges is outreach, reaching out to people, because we see this all the time. Usually, we're a, we're a small, you know, the, the the office that supports the work of the, of the Permanent Forum, the Secretariat of the Forum, there is, right now, there's eight of us in that office. And we don't have a budget to go out to, to the different countries. So we rely on our colleagues in the UN system that have a presence in the different countries. We rely on colleagues in UNDP, in UNICEF, and in all the other UN agencies. So we work with them, and they are the ones then that work at the country level, who work then with the, uh, the local NGOs and the government in, in getting the word out. But the honest, honestly, every time when I've traveled to countries where indigenous peoples are fighting for their rights, and I start talking to them about the permanent forum, most people, except you know, the really dedicated activists, they never heard of the permanent forum. And that's just the way it is. So we have so much work to be done. And we're doing it with relatively limited resources, and we have to rely. That's why we're working with our uh, friends in the NGO community, and working with uh, the UN agencies, and also the member states, because we, in this, the, uh, the forum itself, can't, can't we, you know, we don't have the, the bodies to do it. Uh, I sort of personally reject the thought of the integrity of sovereignty because the. Spoken to a number of indigenous nations around the world, the question always comes down to economics. Sovereignty has no bearing on economics. So, one of my questions is simply do you have a model that is being exported globally to start to develop a sense of understanding of economics, not necessarily the village becoming agro farmers, but an understanding? Because they have literally been forced, in some some instances, at um, pain of death, they've been forced to uh, uh, import American hybrid crops. So, in, in a real instance, a lot of the uh, suffering in, Ethi in a place like Ethiopia could be eliminated with some type of perhaps UN intervention. And also, the same thing is true in South America. Many, many of our relatives. Uh, are having their plants being transferred into pharmaceutical dollars on the stock exchange and there's nothing going to our relatives. And I'm wondering what model uh, does the front forum or have to at least bring that voice to the population of their own media? You know, there's two good cooperatives in the world. One is 
one's in Africa, the other one does coffee, and everybody else is sort of standing there. So the question is, do you have models to address this? If so, what can we do to support that? Chief, thank you very much for um, allowing us on your territory, number one, and number two, for hosting us this evening. And um, your question in terms of um, sustainable models, of economic models, what the permanent form um, has seen um, are communities that come forward with their own models. And what we are able to do is create a forum where governments are sitting in our meetings and are able to see that there are certain economic development models that are working in indigenous communities that should be looked at, um, replicated, or, or really left alone, um, and not um, invaded by uh, financial institutions such as maybe the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Um, but there, as you say, there's mo there are models that are working. Um, but there are also uh, there are also parts of industry that will find some of those models and take pieces out, such as genetic information. Um, that will be patented um, and sold and a profit made. There is an institute there is a part of the uh, a, a part of the uh, UN that's called WIPO. It stands for the World Intellectual Property Organization. And within that organization of the UN um, there is a specific area that looks at protecting the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. And indigenous peoples meet once or twice a year to see to it that systems are put in place um, that protect the intellectual property of indigenous peoples. But th these are long-term um, models that we're looking at. And and, there, and we have to rely on the goodwill of governments and industry to follow them and to protect the knowledge of indigenous peoples. But I, I see what you're saying. Sometimes it's not going to work, um, and, and it doesn't. It doesn't. The, the thievery continues on not only our genetic material for research, without our free, prior, and informed consent, which is what El Sistematopola, the former bureau chief of the Secretariat, said in her film, that what we are looking at and what we are trying to promote is anything that is decided that affects indigenous peoples must include the minimum standard of free, prior, and informed consent. And I think the best model that I could give you is when you go to the hospital and you need surgery, you have to sign something. It's done with your free, prior, and informed consent. And we are looking at that minimum standard. And when Brody talked about the passage of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in that declaration contains those principles, the free, prior, and informed consent of Indigenous Peoples. Um, we have those things. Will they be implemented? We have to hope that the goodwill of civil society uh, will do it. We have to remember also that many of these initiatives uh, that are coming out of the UN are, are recent initiatives, and we have hundreds and hundreds of years of violations compounded, and the UN is playing almost catch up, right? And, and the world is playing catch up to the idea of civil, uh, civil rights for all, human rights for all. And so that, that's another thing that we also have to, to consider why it's so important that we're all educated on the issues why we have to make ourselves and our communities educated on these issues so they'll be better